Good morning and welcome to Moments of Encounter. My name is Father Michael Irwin. I'm the pastor at St. Catherine Drexel Parish in Beaverdam, Wisconsin, as well as the tribe parishes of Klein and Reese Villanelba. It's my honor to be with you this morning to open up the scripture readings and allow ourselves to enter into an ever deeper prayer. Great insight came upon us this week that prayer is always a river. It's like a stream, a beautiful, you know, pure stream. Um, and sometimes it goes really fast, and other times it kind of heads into a pool. And when it heads into a pool, it slows down, but it goes very deep. And during this time of COVID, we may not be able to run around and do as much as we used to do. We might have to sit still, but that might allow us to go deeper. And so let us pray. Loving God, you give us all kinds of good things. You give us your hope and your strength. Help us to rely heavily upon you. And in that experience, gain life. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our second reading for this weekend is from the first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. Brothers and sisters, you know what sort of people we were among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, receiving the word in great affliction with joy from the Holy Spirit, so that you became a model for all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For from the word of the Lord has sounded forth not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves openly declare about us what sort of reception we had among you, and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to await the Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the coming wrath. Isn't that beautiful? He's praising the Thessalonians because they are such uh, great people. They are people who turn away from idols and towards the Lord. And why would we do that? Why would we turn away from our idols? It's such a good question. But idols to me are things that we get caught up in, put a lot, in putting energy into. But at the end, we suddenly realize that what we're putting energy into is just taking something from us and just kind of eating us alive. And so we can say, why don't I go away from putting all that energy into something that's just taking from me and instead put it into something that is very giving. For me, the experience was, you know, my time with uh, video games. And when I was a young adult, probably about 23, 24 years old, I started playing these various video games. And before I would look up, it'd be like a few hours had gone by. And yes, it was a good little kind of get away from it all. But pretty soon after, I realized, wow, what an extraordinary use of my time. This video game just ate up hours and hours of my time. What am I doing? You know, I'm starting to lose my life. It's I'm blinking, and suddenly it's gone. This video game has really not given me anything. All I'm doing is taking my time. So for me kind of, you know, putting up some sort of wall, some sort of barrier to this thing I would call for me an idol, which is a video game, um, and then turning more time to God and to people and to friendships and to family, uh, something that would have some hope of giving back to me. And of course, that's what I find within God. I find that God is constantly giving back to me. And so we have a wonderful opportunity to trust that and to listen to that in prayer. And there's a wonderful little song here from a guy named Jason Silver. I love you, Lord. You are my strength. The Lord's my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. I'll trust in you, my shield and the salvation, my strong tower. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so I'll be saved from my enemies. The cords of death surround and the flood Yes. 
Isn't that a beautiful song? It's so easy to listen to. Uh, but it helps us to put some words into what we feel when we go into that quiet of prayer, that God truly loves us, that the maker of the universe somehow wants to pay attention to us and isn't terribly judgmental about the whole thing. Our God comes to us because he understands exactly how we were made with our strengths and our weaknesses and is simply with us, being attentive to us. And then we learn how to be attentive to God. Recently, there was a commercial that was put on uh, by the Catholic Church. I don't know what part of it, but they did. Um, and the young man in the advertisement was talking about how when he got into prayer and then eventually got into religion, somehow he could find a peacefulness and a purpose that otherwise was eluding him in life. And he did so, he just kind of communicated this in a very realistic way. And I think that's the best way for us to explain it to folks, this experience of not pouring our energy into something that doesn't give us energy back, but rather putting our time and our effort into a relationship with God who loves us so completely that we can categorize him as our strength. And we take that as an individual experience, and now we think of it, therefore, in a broader um, experiences, societal experiences we hear from the Gospel of Matthew. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a scholar of the law, tested Jesus by asking, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love the Lord your neighbor as yourself. The whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So a couple things I want to point out here. First off, Jesus is under a lot of duress here. They are plotting to kill him. He knows this. These questions are not kind of idle questions that, you know, just kind of a platform for him to, you know, teach, but rather they're trying to trip him up. They're trying to uh, find a reason to put him to death. And so they, in the midst of all of these takers and this kind of environment, this culture of takers that he's in, Jesus is giving in a very kind very loving, very patient way, Jesus is helping to remember the essentials of our faith. So he's not reacting to their hostility with more hostility. Rather, he's answering their hostility with love and perspective and a call to service. And that kind of generosity, that kind of charity from our God elicits from us to be in a culture of charity, a culture of kindness, a culture of giving. Um, something we need to always be focused on as individuals is, are we in a lot of relationships with people who are takers? We can pour energy into these relationships, we can be kind to them, but at the end of the day, they can be very mean-spirited back to us and can be very exacting and very punishing. You know, that can be just zapping energy so different than what we experience from God. How much better would it be to be part of a culture of givers? Not perfect people, but a culture of givers, of people who always want to strive to help. Um, sometimes they have to take. Everyone needs to take once in a while. Everybody needs to have their own peaceful times. They have to have their own stuff. They, you know, it's okay to have things that are we call mine, but as a whole, to be in a culture of givers and that we participate in that, that we find ways to give to others. And I think of all of our various service groups in our community. Some of our Catholic, like the St. Vincent de Paul Society, I'll go into the store, love going into the back room, see all these people, all these volunteers working away, fixing things, cleaning things, folding things. It's such a happy space because these are a bunch of folks who are just doing this out of the kindness of their heart in order to sustain, sustain the mission, to be able to care for the poor. It's really such a positive experience. Even if I had a day that's not going entirely well, if I walk into that back room, I think, what kindness. 
I'll get that oftentimes within service organizations in our community, the um, Optimist Clubs and Lions Clubs and the like. But a bunch of really good folk who are trying to do something to help others. That's what those whole organizations were built for. They were built by what's called the greatest generation, that wonderful group that's close to 80, 90, 100 years old right now, um, people who came through some very difficult times. They came through the Depression. They were probably children of immigrants. They still remembered how hard it was to be an immigrant, and they end up being the kindest, nicest people, forming Um, whole generations and organizations based around being giving because they were so grateful for what had been given them that they decided to give others. By the way, this is what our first reading is about from the book of Exodus, Um, but I won't read all that to you now because I'm running out of time. (laughs) But in any case, um, that's the concept. We could still be a part of that. We don't have to participate in a culture of takers which sometimes in that culture we feel like we have to take too. You know, I see that going on right now in our, our country when it comes to COVID and there's these stimulus bills and they want to send out the stimulus checks to just everybody. Why are you saying it to everybody? Some of us have a full-time job. We don't need it. But inside of our heart says, well, if I don't grab the money now, you know, I may never be able to take it. And so we feel like we're like the U.S. has become a culture of takers, and the only way to fit into the culture is to be a taker. Um, and I think that's a tragic turn of events. Hopefully we can keep this mission statement of Jesus given towards the end of his life, some of the last words that he can say to us, and keep this clear in our minds when we're trying to make decisions. You know, we might still disagree with each other as to political decisions we make and which candidate we vote for. But hopefully we have the same generous giving attitude when we pull the trigger or we mark the ballot, uh, that we're trying to love our neighbor as ourselves. So my vote's not just for me, my vote is also for my neighbor and, and for the lowly people, the elderly and the like. This is my vote for all these folks, for the unborn, for people who are immigrants, a whole bunch of variety of people. I'm not just voting for myself in some sort of like selfish thing, but rather I'm trying to find a way to think of other people and to vote for others. Because even if we differ with each other over who we pick for candidates, we will agree with each other about the attitude about being givers. And so let us pray. Loving God, you give us so many good gifts including this opportunity to pray and get perspective. Every time we talk to you, Lord, we feel like we're being given more than we could possibly give back, which is exactly what you intend to do, so that from your kindness we can adjust our own behavior and adjust the culture eventually so that we can be a culture of true givers. May you send your Spirit upon us that we will know how to do so this week. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And again, I'm Father Mike Irwin. I'm the pastor at St. Catherine Drexel Parish in Beaverdam, Wisconsin, as well as the tri parishes in Kleiman, Reesville, and Alba. May God give you a blessed week. i uh-huh.